Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. Welcome to Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. I'm your host, Mark Goldman. In this episode, I sat down with Blythe Arguez of RSM. RSM is the national accounting firm that acquired Paget Stratum and the regional firm in the San Antonio and Austin area. Blythe handles recruiting for that organization. However, she's a CPA and started her career out in accounting and finance through tax. She's got a very interesting story. I think this is going to be very valuable for students that are getting ready to enter the field and start their career, as well as professionals that are trying to chart their their own course and figure out what's right for them. I think she's got some really good insight on career choices as well. So here we go. I hope you enjoy. Well, good morning, Blythe. I appreciate you taking the time today to, to share some of your story with us. How are you doing? I'm good. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. No problem. No problem. You know, I, I was really looking forward to this because your career is has taken a little different turn than some. Actually, you and I have a, a few things in common. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, that was, and, and I was hoping, and, and we won't start with this, we'll We'll leave this till the end to keep people on the line, but really hoping to get some insight from you on you know what it takes to be successful these days, because obviously you're very involved in the recruiting process for a major, major accounting firm here in South Texas that's even become more major, I guess, in the last few months. So there again, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge with us today. So let's get started. <laughs> One of the first things I wanted to ask, because I of the teaser a little bit there, how did you decide to get into accounting in the first place? Well, that's actually a little bit of a funny story. I always say that I didn't find accounting that found me because I started out accounting as an accounting major in college and got a little intimidated, I guess, by the classes and I guess just all the horror stories that I'd heard of public accounting. And so... In the beginning of my junior year, I actually switched my major from accounting to finance to just kind of, you know, get away from what I was so afraid of. And I initially wanted to go into financial planning and landed in Houston briefly with a, a financial planning company right out of college and quickly realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. And just by complete luck, I always say I submitted my resume to Arthur Anderson and my resume was pulled out of a stack of about a hundred. And um, there was a new <laughs> group. Yeah. I always have fun. I'm like, wow, I always felt very blessed by that one. But yes. my partner that I was working for was starting up a new group. He was looking for finance and accounting majors. And it was in it was in the group of tax. And I always laugh because I'm pretty sure that wasn't clear in the job description. And when I interviewed, they just kept saying financial services, financial services. And so I thought, okay, well, that, you know, that makes sense. I have a finance background. And well, when I showed up for my first day of work, my name tag said lead tax services. And I remember going up to the HR uh, manager and I said, I believe that you've got me in the wrong group. My name tag says lead tax services. And she said, yeah, the financial services group. <laughs> and I said, yes. Oh, my gosh. I've been taxed. <laughs> I think you are mistaken. I am not a tax accountant. Yeah, so 11 years later, I apparently did become a tax accountant. But during that time, I was working for Arthur Anderson, and <clears throat> Arthur Anderson obviously went through some troubles. And through that, I ended up at Deloitte, still working for the same partner. And while at Deloitte, it became clear that when I started at Anderson, um, I asked the question about, you know, I'm not eligible to sit for the CPA exam. Is that going to hinder my career if I do decide to stay, even though in my head I had no plans of staying very long? And so at the time, Anderson 
said no, that, you know, that would not be a problem. And then when we got to Deloitte, it took a little while when we landed at Deloitte to kind of get the, I think they had taken on a lot of new employees in a very short period of time and were trying to figure out if they needed any new policies in place. And so right before I believe I was about to be promoted to manager, they did come out with a policy that required for managers to have their CPA. And I was still 30 hours away from that. And there were a couple of other people in my group that were kind of in the same boat. They had finance backgrounds. And so we were, our group was very unique in the sense that it was very difficult. It was a, it was a very specialized skill set and it was not something that you could just go out and hire someone from another group to come in and, and walk in as a manager. And so we were basically, there were three of us, we were basically grandfathered in and allowed to move up in our career pending that we would start the coursework and, and get our CPAs. And from there, we couldn't move up until we completed that. So I went back to school while I was working. I think I ended up having to take 33 hours of accounting to be eligible oh to sit for the CPA exam. Yeah, that was not very fun, I must admit, which is always why I'm such a big proponent with a lot of our students as far as telling them to get their CPA early and don't wait to finish up the coursework, go ahead and get it done. And so. Anyway, yeah, that's that's kind of my path, I guess, into accounting and getting my CPA and why I always laugh and say it kind of found me. I mean, I was running from it and it still, you know, ended up being where I landed and pretty much forged my career. Wow. You know, a couple of questions come to mind. I'm just curious, how old were you at that point when you went back to college? Because I know that's always a challenge. People's lives are already starting. And I think I was... 29 or 30. I think, yeah, I think I was turning 30. And it was interesting. It was interesting for a couple of reasons. I realized, I remember when I was in college, they, I had at one point thought about doing my MBA and they always said that, and this is a little bit different from the accounting world, but for MBAs, they wanted students to maybe graduate with their undergraduate, work for a few years and then come back and get their MBA, which is a little bit different, I think, from how the accounting world works because of the 100, at least in Texas, 150 hour requirement. But I didn't really understand that until I went back to school and I realized, one, I was a lot more studious <laughs> most of the 30 <laughs> than I was when I was 20. You have a lot less time. And so you have to be much more disciplined and very focused when you're sitting down, you don't get as much time to study. And so the time that you do get, you have to make the most of it. And so you learn how to manage a lot more and you just, you look at it differently. I was, you know, I didn't have the chance to, I was just a lot more focused and a lot more disciplined. So, and I had different life experiences that I was able to bring into the classroom. And it was interesting. There was another coworker of mine that was going through it with me. And she was even, I think she was closer to 40. And there were a couple of classes where they would do case studies. And the Anderson case study came up many times. And it was very funny that we were sitting in the classroom and could actually share our experiences because we had gone through, we were in the Houston office where everything was taking place. And so we had actually lived through all of that. And so we were able to provide some insight. And granted, we were pretty young in our careers. And so I don't know sure. that we fully understood at the time what was going on, but it was just funny because our professors would always look at us and say, how were you working at Anderson during that time? And we would just kind of explain, you know, kind of how we've gotten where we were, but it was definitely different going back. And just also having the amount of responsibilities that I did on my plate at that time with my job, as opposed to being 21, 22, maybe starting out your career and trying to sit for the CPA. It was very different. Yes, yes, very different. Actually, I think I think now the average age to pass the exam is 30, and you were just getting started going back to school at that point. <laughs> oh, I'm surprised it's actually that high. Those must not be the people that are around me because I am constantly like, get your CPA, get your CPA, get it early. It's so much harder in life. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, another thing you said, and, and I'm going to I want to circle back. I know this was very early, but you mentioned that you got started in financial planning for a very short time and that it wasn't for you. And, and I, I see other people with accounting backgrounds in particular try out financial planning and end up moving on. It seems to be one of those fields that you know it takes a 
a very specific skill set or, or type of person to be successful in. I, I'm curious, what are your thoughts? What what was it about financial planning that wasn't um, quite the right fit? And I want to be careful about my answer because I think my answer was probably more unique to the company that I was working for. And so I think that especially tax accounting and financial planning really go hand in hand very well together. And I see some students that have chosen there are a couple of schools I know of where they actually have tracks where one of the programs available to get their 150 hours, they're able to choose accounting and I think financial planning. And so I think those are those are great options. For me, what I didn't understand about financial planning is that oftentimes, well, again, I was a very lofty college student at the time who wanted to help people. And I didn't realize that a lot of times the people that probably need the most help from the perspective that I was thinking of on how to manage their money are the ones that oftentimes don't have any money to be managed. Sure. And (laughs) where from a business perspective in financial planning, it's oftentimes more of kind of a, you're helping someone manage their retirement or their assets. And so that involves also helping them decisions on, or can, some can involve helping them make decisions on different assets or, you know, securities to invest in. And what was unique about our firm is that we actually did not offer any sort of products. So it was a fee-based only firm, which makes it difficult in that type of field when you're asking someone to pay a fee to help them manage their money, but then they still have to go somewhere else and pay another fee for them to actually make the investment that you told them back then we actually were making. It it was very common to tell them to expect an 8% rate of return, which is kind of funny to me today. But you were having to send them down the street to someone else to say, okay, now help me find the securities that I, you know, can invest in to find that rate of return. So that was one of the reasons I didn't really care for it. And two, there was a lot of sales involved in it. And I can't say this for every place, but for me, that was, sales comes in a lot of different forms. For me, you know, I have a lot of selling in my job now. I'm selling a firm and, you know, people I may not be selling a particular product. And so I, it's funny, I currently kind of do do sales now, but in that particular field, that was not something that I wanted to do. And I didn't feel comfortable going to family and friends and trying to drum up business. And that is a very elementary way of looking at it. But when you're starting out, that is sometimes, oh, it's often where they tell you to start. And I just wasn't comfortable with that. And it could be that I didn't feel like I had friends that had the assets at the time that would be useful. So it just wasn't a good fit for me. Okay. Well, I asked that question for a very specific reason. I suspected the latter a reason that you gave, because I find that a lot of times people going into that field, they overestimate how much investment analysis and investment decision making they're going to be doing, and they underestimate the amount of cold calling and sales that they're going to have to do. And it looks glamorous from the outside, and it's a very important function, but it's it's a lot of work on the inside, and it's not for everybody. So It is. And and I want to be, you know, we currently have opportunities that are kind of within the financial planning, financial I guess, management type area. And, and there are certain licenses that you have to have in order to be able to sell different securities and different things like that. And not all opportunities require that. I mean, there are, I think, opportunities even within our firm that are probably more in line with maybe what I was initially looking for. But at the time, I was so green, I didn't even know what was out there. And so this particular firm is where I landed and just thought, no, not a good fit for me. But yeah, there is stuff. I mean, a lot of the opportunities, like you said, do involve a lot of cold calling. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> well, to get back on track, I guess, from that, I'm sorry to take that tangent, but so you're no, sitting no. at Deloitte and, and you're pursuing the CPA exam and going to school, I guess, and pursuing it. And, and I see that you ended up moving on to Paget in San Antonio correct? The San Antonio office? I did, but I actually took a little detour first. Um, Oh, okay. (laughs) During my time at Deloitte while I was getting my CPA, there were a couple of things that were happening. One, I was, you know, working all day and then going to school at night or studying. And I I just, I think I was reaching my max level of capacity of accounting. 
And I also was part of a management team that went through some personality testing and then we they were looking at it kind of from a global perspective of how we work together as a team. And, you know, I'm very careful to, to, to say this part just because I think personality analysis are wonderful tools, but I, I get nervous when people just peg someone and say, you know, this is what you are and this is the path you have for you. I mean, I am a perfect example. I mean, I was very successful in what I was doing, even though it felt far, far outside of my natural and normal strengths lend themselves to. But I ended up taking a personality test and learned that I, if you were to break it down into quadrants, I was about as far away in the quadrant as you could get from a tax accountant. And most of my other coworkers were clustered near each other. And then I was just this one little anomaly way off on the chart. And it did kind of explain to me, I'd always felt a little bit like a shot of water. For one, I really like to talk a lot. And you often find that most tax accountants don't tend to be chatty Cathy's. So, um, <laughs> you know, I didn't really quite ever fully understand that until I took this, this test. And so, those two things together, I just was kind of reaching my point of, you know, I think I'm, I, I think I need to look for new opportunities. And it, during my search, nothing really seemed appealing to me. And several recruiters had offered different opportunities to me. And then one or two of them had actually said, what about, have you considered doing recruiting? And I had never thought about it. And probably by about the second or third one that mentioned that to me, I thought maybe there's something here. And so I actually left to go work for a small consulting firm that they mainly did accounting consulting. They were, a lot of the senior leadership were former Deloitte auditors and they had a small recruiting arm that I went to work for. And that was probably what gave me my entrance into the world of recruiting. And I was only there about 20 months because, again, it was very much cold calling. And one of the things I've learned about my role or about myself through different articles and taking different personality analysis is while I love to talk and I love to engage with people, cold calling is about the worst thing you can do for someone like me. I'm not really sure what the correlation is, but I was doing a lot of cold calling. And the one thing I did do very well in that role was develop relationships. So I might not have accomplished as many calls as I needed to do on a daily basis, but my old boss told me, she said, you may not ever hand me 10 resumes. When you hand me that one resume for this particular job, she said, I'm 99% sure that's the person they're going to hire. So it was a great kind of entrance for me, but it was just, again, not quite where I thought I should be or wanted to be at the time. And so I was also kind of reaching a point where my family had moved out to the Bernie area outside of San Antonio and thought, you know, it might be time for a change. And so I started looking for opportunities in the San Antonio area. And it was funny, I had a recruiter that I was working with and she kept offering a, a position to me about the firm called Paget. And the one thing I told her when I started was I am completely done with that public accounting. I don't want to talk about public accounting opportunities. I don't want to go back into that field. I had just kind of, I was really burned out, to be honest. Sure. And so she would try other opportunities and she's coming back. She's like, why don't you give some patches try? And I'm like, what part of, I don't want public accounting do not understand. And she finally wore me down and I agreed to take an interview. And I'm so thankful that she continued to push. I think she gets a lot of time. She reminded me a lot myself in the way that I would recruit candidates in the sense that she'd taken the time initially to listen to me about what I wanted, what I was looking for. And I think she could see through that, that Paget would have, you know, would be a good fit. And so that's how I ended up at Paget. But when I went back into public accounting, I decided to go back into tax because at the time I was like, well, again, this hasn't really been what I really wanted to do. And I probably need to get my, in my head, I thought I need to get my career back on track. And I guess taxes is, is, is where it is. And so I ended up at Paget in San Antonio, but within a year, they had created a recruiting role and I was able to move into that role, um, which is currently the role I'm still in right now. So I, yeah, I took a little detour for a little bit and then back into accounting and then ultimately back into recruiting, but kind of from a different perspective. Wow. You never know how things are going to work out. That's ended up being a wonderful move. 
It get to really do what was. You enjoy once again. <laughs> yes. Yes, and I love what I do now. It's really the perfect mixture of everything I've done in my career. The accounting background, but also getting to talk to people, find out their story, um, find out what makes them tick, and you know, see if I can help them find a, a, a place where they can flourish at our firm, which is now RSM. Wonderful, wonderful. Is that what you like most about the position, just sort of trying to make the right match? I do. I really... Again, this is probably a little bit different for most tax accountants, but I love to understand what makes people sick. I I love to understand how they think, what their interests are. And that's where I think some of those personalities that are helpful because it sometimes gives you insight to someone that you can't always pick up in conversation. Although I've gotten pretty good at being able to meet someone and talk to them for a little bit and kind of in my head have an idea of where I think they might fall. But I love just trying to figure out where to me, it's kind of like a puzzle. Like, and it's, it's trying, you know, that person is a puzzle piece, the opportunities are a puzzle piece, and just finding where that puzzle fits together. And, you know, and, and sometimes I do come across candidates that, I mean, I try to be honest with candidates. And I think oftentimes sure. that it, it's not always maybe what they want to hear, but I think in the end, it, it endears them. I mean, in the sense of they know I'm looking out for, you know, I've made what I, thought were mistakes throughout my career. And they probably, in looking back, weren't necessarily mistakes. They were, you know, the path I was taking to get where I am. But I think I took the long road to get here. And and sometimes people need to walk that. But I wish someone would have known me a little bit better and been able to give me some guidance early on. And it, I might have still ended up exactly where I am and, and taken the path that I did. But it, I think I would have been more aware of it early on. And so... That's what I try to do with candidates is if I think that, you know, there's something that would be a better fit or maybe a different direction, I, I try to be honest with them. I mean, in the end, it's their decision, so you, know, you have to be very careful about I don't also want to make a decision for someone, but it's kind of finding that balance sure. and helping what, them with their career. What do you do when you have that candidate that, you know, on a personal level, you just really like and you see a lot of promise, but you just know that your firm isn't the right place for them or, or they're, you know, ultimately not going to be the most successful at your firm, but you still want to help them out. How do you handle that? Well, for the last few years, I had focused my role when we were part of Paget, and Paget was a more was a regional firm. I handled both our campus and our experienced hiring, but I spent most of my time on our campus recruiting, and and that is now where my role is completely focused is on the campus recruiting. Side. And so I think the answer is a little different depending on whether you're looking up from the campus side versus the more experienced side. But oftentimes what I try to do is the, the campus process is very structured, at least here in the state of Texas. I feel like there are certain timelines and I guess procedures that you follow. And most of the schools tend to kind of follow the same path. And so it makes it easy for the student, I think, as far as getting a job. But oftentimes I can take a step back and let, you know, kind of open the door for them to engage with other employees and see other parts of the firm. And typically what will happen is one of two things. One, they will either be more convinced that this is the place for them, or they will come to realize that maybe it's not through their interactions with others in the firm. And so a lot of times it, it probably, I guess it kind of fixes itself for lack of a sure. better word or the process that they go through. It's a lengthy process at the campus level. And so it sort of just kind of corrects itself. Now that said, sometimes there have been candidates that I've come across and I do feel like they would be a good fit, but maybe their qualifications weren't quite at the same level as other candidates. And maybe an offer wasn't extended. And I will try to stay in touch with those those students. And even sometimes, you know, maybe I feel like it's going to be a good, a better fit for them, but they'll choose another opportunity. I will stay in touch with those because I feel like there will be an opportunity later down the road where we might be able to reconnect. And again, like I said earlier, you know, I had to take the path that I took to get to where I am. And sometimes people just, they need to take a certain path and maybe for them at that time. It's not the right time to come join us, but that doesn't mean that there won't be opportunities later down the road. And then for those where they just really want to be at our firm and it it just isn't going to work out, I just try to counsel them and help them find other 
opportunities if I can. So it, you kind of just have to look at each situation. Sure, sure. You're helping them get more information on on the true opportunities so they can make a good decision for what's right for them, yes. which makes a lot yes. of sense. Yes. You know, for what it's worth, all of us, once we find, or my belief is that all of us, once we find what we want to do or what we really enjoy doing, we look back and we sort of wish that the path to get there would have been more direct. But the well, reality is yes. <laughs> we wouldn't have been the same people at that point if it had yes. been more direct. So yeah. yeah, just part of the development process. It is. And sometimes, like exactly like you said, sometimes I think my biggest mistake in retrospect, they were probably, not probably, they were exactly what I needed to go through to be where I am, to be the person that I am today. And they've given me a lot of, I always believe that any bad experience you can go through, if, if there's anything you can glean from it and learn to pass on to someone else, then it was not done in vain. So that is kind of how I make myself feel a little bit better about some of what I view as my missteps is, hey, I was able to help someone else, you know, maybe not make that misstep or maybe not get off track for as long as maybe I felt like I had gotten off track and able to help them make maybe a better decision or come to the conclusion a little sooner than I did. It's all about information. Yes, definitely. So what advice would you have for a student or, you know, maybe a prospective intern or maybe a prospective full-time hire that's coming to interview with RSM or, or even a firm such as yours? What do you think it's important for them to know? My first is a little bit of a personal soapbox, but it is make sure you are looking at the coursework that you need to become CPA exam eligible and make sure that you get to that as quickly as you can and that you start the process to take your CPA as quickly as you can. I tell every student that, and I come across some students that say, well, I don't know, maybe I'll work for a little bit and then go back to school, and it's very difficult. And so what I tell most people is, even if you're not sure you want to be in accounting for the rest of your life, go ahead and get that CPA. It's something you will have the rest of your life, you know, barring any crime that you commit, you know, fraudulent activity. That is something someone can't take away from you. You've earned it. It is something that you can take with you. Regardless, I still maintain my CPA and keep up with my hours. And, you know, I worked very hard to get it. And I think it it also helps me to relate to some of our candidates. But that would be the first thing I tell everyone. Beyond that, what I tell them is get to know, there are so many opportunities out there and there's so much information out there and take the opportunities that are put in front of you. And this is one of the things I did not do very well as a college student. Go to the career fairs, go early and get to know the firms. Even if you're not quite at the, you know, the point where you should be interviewing or you're ready to interview, go to these career fairs and get to know the firms. If you can get interviews, go through them and Get through your shyness or get through your interview nerves early on so that by the time you find the opportunity that you think you really want, you'll be ready for it. You know that's where you want to be. Ask questions. Ask questions to people that, you know, the partners in the firm that you made. Ask questions to the staff and the seniors that you made at all different levels. Look at the varying places people are in their career and their life and how it works and what they like about their opportunity and just Gather as much information as you can so that you can make, hopefully, the best decision for you and, and know yourself. That's the other thing is that with gathering that information, a lot of people, and to be honest, I was, you know, back in my day, I think it was still big six at the time, but I, that was all I knew. Now, now granted, I didn't go through the accounting path and I didn't go through the accounting recruiting process, but I only knew the big six accounting firms and I had no idea about the middle market world. And I will say that when I got to Paget, it was a world I'd never really known much about. And I wish that I had known about it a lot earlier. I think I probably would have enjoyed my job maybe a lot better. I like the fact that there's a lot more relationship. There was a lot more kind of what I was looking for initially of wanting to help people. You you get to engage on that level, I think, with the middle market type clients than you maybe do with the fortune 50 or Fortune 100. And so, but you have to know yourself and you have to know that that's where you'll want to be. You have to know, do you enjoy traveling? Do you enjoy, um, and not just traveling, but do you enjoy being in a different place every week or every month and having different team 
members side by side with you every day, or do you like to go to your desk every day and kind of, you know, be in, are you a creature path? but it be in a familiar place. All those things are things, wow, I did not know or even know that I needed to know when I was going through. That makes a lot of sense. That's good advice. Get out there and practice a little bit and, and be sure you know mm-hmm. yourself. That makes a lot of sense. Yes. It does. Well, there's four questions I end every podcast with, and we're getting to that point. So I want to run these by you. Hopefully, the listeners get some insight from this as well. First of all, what has been your proudest moment? Oh, my proudest moment, there are probably a lot that would compete for number one. I'll pick two. My first one was, I think, when I was promoted to manager at Deloitte. That was a very proud moment for me. One, just because I didn't come in with the same accounting knowledge as everyone else. And I, I felt like I had to work twice as hard to learn the subject matter. And my second one is probably when I moved into the recruiting role at Paget because it seemed like everything that I had done in my career finally all made sense. And like I had said earlier, that you know, there were things that I deemed to kind of be missteps and it was like all those missteps finally came together and it completed the puzzle. And I finally figured out why I went through those things. And it was to be in the role that I was in. It all made sense all of a sudden. <laughs> yes, it, it did. It very much did. Well, tell us about a mistake you've made and what you learned from it. And frankly, the more colossal, the better. So I've alluded to this a lot throughout our conversation. But I think my, again, two things that I think be are my biggest mistakes were probably two of the things that I needed to go, well, at least one of them I needed to go through. The first one was probably changing my major from accounting to finance. In the end, I still went back to school and got the hours to get to the CPA, but it was a lot more difficult and it was a lot more painful than it needed to be. Not quite sure that going back to school in my 30s, I don't know how much that really added to my life, but the second one was probably when I left Deloitte and I went to work at a consulting firm. At first, I thought it was, you know, the greatest decision I ever made. And then very quickly, I was like, oh, I don't know. This is not really for me. Maybe this was a big mistake. Maybe I you know, got my career off course and a lot of doubts about that. And so that is why when I got the role in recruiting at Paget, I finally felt it all made sense. I needed to go and have that background in recruiting for the role at Paget to be open to me and to make sense. And I couldn't understand that until that role appeared in front of me. So that one definitely what I viewed as a mistake was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. The changing from accounting to finance, I think I probably could have done without that one. So I don't know. (laughs) Y'all don't know that much about finance careers outside of how they're related to accounting, but I'm wondering if an accounting major is more accepted in the finance world than a finance major is accepted in the accounting world. I would say yes. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of opportunities in the finance world that it never hurts to have those accounting hours. And there are a lot of programs that also have either dual majors or they offer a track in the the 150-hour accounting program, but it offers a track in finance. And for those that have an interest in the finance world, I often kind of direct them towards that. There are some very specific programs within the finance world that I think do make sense, but for a student who was like me that really didn't know what they, they weren't exactly sure what they wanted to do, probably, you know, getting that accounting degree, keeping those options as broad as possible would have been a better decision. And that's, again, what I tell a lot of students. Make sure you're giving yourself the best foundation you can so you have the most available opportunities when you go to school. Sure, sure. Well, third question, who's been the biggest mentor so far in your career or the biggest influence on your career? <laughs> the partner that I worked for at Arthur Anderson and Deloitte, probably my biggest mentor. I don't know that he would even have thought that at the time. And at the time, I don't know that I would have thought that he was the biggest mentor. He scared me half to death when I first started working there. He was very intense and he had a lot of high expectations. And I made a lot of mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. I definitely made my fair share of them and a lot of them early on. And I 
thought every other day he was going to fire me, but it was through his, he was so smart and, and had such a great business head about him and just leading by example. And he really worked very closely with his staff and his seniors. And especially early on when he was starting the group and now in looking at the world of public accounting, I realize that that's not always how it works. You don't often, a lot of times you don't find the, the partner working directly with the staff and he did with me and with several others. And I think it really influenced a lot of us in our careers. And yeah, to this day, I still stay in touch with him and he's just, he supported me while I was going back to school and he just, he's been a great influence on me throughout my career and probably had no idea he was even influencing me that way as I was going through. Sure. You know, I think that's pretty common when we're being mentored or when we're learning so much from someone, a lot of times you don't realize it until later when you look back and you realize what a profound impact they had on, on your ability to move up or to move on or to learn about yourself. I, that, I think that's pretty common. Pretty common. Yes, yes. Bob. His, sorry, I forgot his name. Is Bob Siegel. He definitely shaped my career in a lot of different ways. He actually was also the one that gave me my first, first kind of introduction to the world of recruiting. And I didn't even realize that at the time our group was growing by leaps and bounds and our HR department having a hard time really keeping up with the amount of hiring we were doing. And so Bob had received special permission to allow us to kind of do our own soliciting resumes and bringing candidates in and interviewing them. And he identified me early on to do a lot of the phone screens and then to make sure that I met with the candidates and they would come in and he could interview with them. And that was probably the very, very beginning of my interest into the recruiting world. And I didn't even realize at the time that he saw something in me and he, you know, that he saw something special in me that I didn't even see myself at the time. And that was my ability to connect and identify good talent. Very valuable. Very valuable. Well, last question, then we'll wrap it up. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Don't quit. And it probably went on to say, believe in yourself, trust in yourself. There are a lot of things that will come at you in your career that are going to make you second guess yourself all the time. And sometimes it's a period you go through. Sometimes it's just a day that you're having, but really digging deep down inside and finding the thing that keeps you going and not letting the situation, whether it's a particular project that you're working on that's maybe challenging, or maybe it's the people that you're working with. I've had, and everyone will, they will encounter people throughout their career that aren't pleasant or are just not the best coworkers to have. And you have to be careful to just set that aside and not let it keep you from doing you know, what you think you need to be doing or going where you think you need to be going. And you just have to keep forging ahead and you just, you don't quit. And and that doesn't mean that you don't, I think I always thought that meant you stayed in the same place. That is over time, I've realized, that doesn't mean that you can't change into another company or change roles. It just means that you don't just give up and give in to whatever project is making you feel like it's about to eat you alive or whether it's a worker, you just keep going and you keep your head held up high and you look at where you want to go and you keep going. I bet you thought about that. Don't quit at least 30 times as you were getting 30 extra hours in order to become a CPA. <laughs> um, more like 30 million. Probably. <laughs> if you have that many seconds in a lifetime, then yes. I have told myself that many, many times. And I have to give my mom credit too, because she's probably, you know, those late night calls when you're just at your limit and you're just crying and well, maybe you guys go, but you're just at that moment where you're like, I can't go anymore. And she was like, yes, you can keep moving, keep pushing forward. So yeah, you gotta have, you gotta have support. You gotta have people around you that support you. Yes. Thank you, Mom. Yes. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you, Mom. Well, thank you for joining us. I wouldn't be doing you service if I didn't give you the opportunity to talk about any 
particular openings that you might be looking to fill at RSM? This podcast is yeah. going to come out mid-November. So is there anything in okay. particular you'd like to highlight to our um, listeners? So we will be ramping up come early January for our spring 2018 internships, which just boggles my mind even trying to say that. It just seems so far away. But so right now we're kind of winding down the year, but, you know, for students to be on the lookout for us to post our opportunities, we have offices in all over the United States and actually all over the world, but I specifically focus within the state of Texas and more specifically on our San Antonio and Austin office. And we also have a Houston and Dallas office. And so there will be consulting and audit and tax internship opportunities. And so lots of hiring in those areas. So be on the lookout for those. So Blythe, if people want to find out more about your own story or want to find out more about openings and the organization over all over there at RSM, what's the best way to reach you? Probably through LinkedIn. You don't have to be connected to me necessarily to be able to send an email. And I believe my contact information is on my LinkedIn account as well. But if it's not, you can send an email and it will come straight to my email address at RSM. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. You know, as I look over the notes, I I really think that for those of us that are a little further on in our career, your story provides us some clarity on our own lives and and why maybe we went through certain steps in our career. And and for those that are younger professionals or up-and-coming professionals, I think you provided a lot of good guidance for them. So this is going to be very beneficial to our listeners. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, good. Thank you so much, Mark. I hope that it does help someone as they're trying to start out their career. And RSM is definitely a great place for, I think, people to start their career and to make a long-term career path. So I look forward to hearing from anyone and hope this definitely helps someone. Well, thank you again. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Have a good day. All right. Thank you, Mark. Bye-bye. Well, that was my interview with Blythe Arguez of RSM. She's had a very interesting career, starting in finance, actually, then getting into accounting, then becoming a CPA and getting into tax, and then finally into what she truly enjoys, recruiting for accounting positions here at RSM in Austin and San Antonio. I think she shared some good nuggets for those just getting their career started at the entry level, how to be successful and and how to find what you truly enjoy. And then I think she had some good insight for those of us that are a little more experienced as well as to why maybe certain steps have happened in our own careers. Until next time, please subscribe to the Where Accountants Go podcast if you have not already done so at whereaccountantsgo.com. Please share with your friends. We're looking forward to providing you more episodes. There's more to come.